Welcome to A Year of War and Peace. I'm your host, Brian E. Denton. A Year of War and Peace is a daily, year-long, chapter-by-chapter reading of and meditation on Leo Tolstoy's epic novel, War and Peace. In these videos and podcasts, you'll be treated to a free reading of one chapter per day of the novel, plus a reflective essay I've written individually tailored to that day's chapter. These readings are offered for free, though if you'd like to support me, you can do so in one of three ways. First, you could purchase my ebook, A Year of War and Peace. It features the entire novel, plus all of my reflective essays, and it's only $2.99 on Amazon.com. You could also become a patron at patreon.com slash Brian E. Denton. If you sign up there, you'll receive a sonnet once a month, plus a link to an ebook of my collected sonnets. Finally, if you'd like, you can make a one-time donation to my PayPal account. The email there is brianedenton at gmail.com. You can also use that email to contact me. I'd be happy to hear from you. Your support is greatly appreciated. Today's reading and reflection comes from chapter 341. Chapter 341. One matter connected with his management sometimes worried Nicholas, and that was his quick temper, together with his old hussar habit of making free use of his fists. At first, he saw nothing reprehensible in this. But in the second year of his marriage, his view on that form of punishment suddenly changed. Once in summer, he had been sent for the village elder from Bogachevaro, a man who succeeded to the post when John died, and who was accused of dishonesty and various irregularities. Nicholas went out into the porch to question him, and immediately after the elder had given a few replies, the sound of cries and blows were heard. On returning to lunch, Nicholas went up to his wife, who sat with her head bent low over her embroidery frame, and as usual began to tell her what he had been doing that morning. Among other things, he spoke of the Bogotrevaro elder. Countess Mary turned red and then pale, but continued to sit with head bowed and lips compressed, and gave her husband no reply. "'Such an insolent scoundrel!' he cried, growing hot again at the mere recollection of him. "'If he had told me he was drunk and did not see me—' "'What is the matter with you, Mary?' he suddenly asked. "'Countess Mary raised her head and tried to speak, "'but hastily looked down again, and her lips puckered. "'Why, whatever is the matter, my dearest?' "'The looks of the plain Countess Mary always improved when she was in tears. "'She never cried from pain or vexation, "'but always from sorrow or pity, "'and when she wept, her radiant eyes acquired an irresistible charm.' The moment Nicholas took her hand, she could no longer restrain herself and began to cry. Nicholas, I saw it. He was to blame. But why do you... Nicholas? And she covered her face with her hands. Nicholas said nothing. He flushed crimson, left her side, and paced up and down the room. He understood what she was weeping about, but could not in his heart at once agree with her that what he had regarded from childhood as quite an everyday event was wrong. Is it just sentimentality, old wives' tales, or is she right? He asked himself. Before he had solved that point, he glanced again at her face filled with love and pain, and he suddenly realized that she was right, and that he had long been sinning against himself. Mary, he said softly, going up to her, it will never happen again. I give you my word, never, he repeated in a trembling voice, like a boy who was asking for forgiveness. The tears flowed faster still from the countess's eyes. She took his hand and kissed it. "'Nicholas, why did you break your cameo?' she asked to change the subject, looking at his finger on which he wore a ring with a cameo of Laogun's head. "'Today, it was the same affair. Oh, Mary, don't remind me of it.' And again he flushed. "'I give you my word of honor. It shan't occur again, and let this always be a reminder to me.' And he pointed to the broken ring." After that, when in discussions with his village elders or stewards, the blood rushed to his face and his fists began to clench, Nicholas would turn to the broken ring on his finger and would drop his eyes before the man who was making him angry. But he did forget himself once or twice within a twelve-month, and then he would go and confess to his wife and would again promise that this should really be the last time. Mary, you must despise me, he would say. I deserve it. "'You should go. Go away at once if you don't feel strong enough to control yourself,' she would reply sadly, trying to comfort her husband. 
Among the gentry of the province, Nicholas was respected but not liked. He did not concern himself with the interests of his own class, and consequently some thought him proud, and others thought him stupid. The whole summer, from spring sowing to harvest, he was busy with the work on his farm. In autumn, he gave himself up to hunting with the same business-like seriousness, leaving home for a month, or even two, with his hunt. In winter, he visited his other villages or spent his time reading. The books he read were chiefly historical, and on these he spent a certain sum every year. He was collecting, as he said, a serious library, and he made it a rule to read through all the books he bought. He would sit in his study with a grave air, reading, a task he first imposed upon himself as a duty, but which afterwards became a habit affording him a special kind of pleasure and a consciousness of being occupied with serious matters. In winter, except for business exertions, he spent most of his time at home making himself one with his family and entering into all the details of his children's relations with their mother. The harmony between him and his wife grew closer and closer, and he daily discovered fresh spiritual treasures in her. From the time of his marriage, Sonia had lived in his house. Before that, Nicholas had told his wife all that had passed between himself and Sonia, blaming himself and commending her. He had asked Princess Mary to be gentle and kind to his cousin. She thoroughly realized the wrong she had done Sonia, felt herself to blame toward her, and imagined that her wealth had influenced Nicholas's choice. She could not find fault with Sonia in any way, and tried to be fond of her, but often felt ill will towards her, which she could not overcome. Once she had a talk with her friend Natasha about Sonia, and about her own injustice towards her. "'You know,' said Natasha, "'you have read the Gospels a great deal. There is a passage in them that just fits Sonia.' "'What?' asked Countess Mary, surprised. "'To him that hath shall be given, and from him that hath not shall be taken away. "'You remember. She is the one that hath not. Why, I don't know. "'Perhaps she lacks egotism. I don't know. "'But from her is taken away, and everything has been taken away. "'Sometimes I am dreadfully sorry for her. "'Formerly I very much wanted Nicholas to marry her, "'but I always had a sort of presentiment that it would not come off. She is a sterile flower, you know, like some strawberry blossoms. Sometimes I'm sorry for her, and sometimes I think she doesn't feel it as you or I would. Though Countess Mary told Natasha that those words in the gospel must be understood differently, yet looking at Sonia, she agreed with Natasha's explanation. It really seemed that Sonia did not feel her position trying, and she had grown quite reconciled to her lot as a sterile flower. She seemed to be fond not so much of individuals as of the family as a whole. Like a cat, she had attached herself not to the people, but to the home. She waited on the old countess, petted and spoiled the children, was always ready to render the small services for which she had a gift, and all this was unconsciously accepted from her with insufficient gratitude. The country seat at Bald Hills had been rebuilt, though not on the same scale as under the old prince. The buildings begun under straitened circumstances, were more than simple. The immense house on the old stone foundation was of wood, plastered only inside. It had bare deal floors, and was furnished with very simple hard sofas, armchairs, tables, and chairs made by their own surf carpenters out of their own birchwood. The house was spacious, and had rooms for the house serfs and apartments for visitors. Whole families of the Rostovs and Bukonskis' relations sometimes came to Bald Hills, with sixteen horses and dozens of servants, and stayed for months. Besides that, four times a year, on the name days and birthdays of the hosts, as many as a hundred visitors would gather there for a day or two. The rest of the year pursued its unbroken routine with its ordinary occupations, and its breakfasts, lunches, dinners, and suppers, provided out of the produce of the estate. All right, that concludes my reading of chapter 341 of War and Peace. I will now proceed to my reflection on the same. A Year of War and Peace, Day 341. Nicholas Rostov and that old Hazar habit. Of those we wrestle with, it is often ourselves who prove to be the most formidable opponent. That is certainly the case with Nicholas Rostov. He just can't control his angry self. He has lost battle after battle in his personal war with anger. Today, however, he gains a victory. He does so by first admitting that he has a problem, and then by devising a methodical response meant to check it. 
One matter connected with his management sometimes worried Nicholas, and that was his quick temper, together with his old hussar habit of making free use of his fists, Tolstoy writes in the opening sentence of today's chapter. It's an important sentence. Note how now, for possibly the first time, Nicholas is not only aware of his anger issues, but worried about them. That's a good first step towards addressing a very serious issue. What to do about it, though? Fortunately, Nicholas has the good sense to consult someone about his problem. Even more fortunate for him, that person is Countess Mary Rostov, his wife, the most consistently emotionally intelligent and virtuous major character in the entire novel. Together, they conclude that not only is his custom of responding to frustration with violent anger wrong, but actually a sin against himself. They decide that a ring he wears, broken during one of his fits, should serve as a reminder to calm himself down whenever he feels himself heating up. Quote, After that, when in discussions with his village elders or the stewards, the blood rushed to his face and his fists began to clench, Nicholas would turn the broken ring on his finger and would drop his eyes before the man who was making him angry. But he did forget himself once or twice within a twelve-month, and then he would go and confess to his wife, and would again promise that this really should be the last time. End quote. So we see that by careful attention to his anger, and mindful immediate reaction to it, Nicholas Rostov finally learns to win more battles against himself than he loses. Daily Meditation it is best, therefore, to apply remedies to oneself as soon as we feel that anything is wrong, to allow oneself as little license as possible in speech, and to restrain one's impetuosity. Now it is easy to detect the first growth of our passions. The symptoms precede the disorder. Seneca on Anger All right, so that concludes my reading of chapter 341. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for listening. Remember that if you'd like to support me, you can do so either by purchasing the ebook A Year of War and Peace, becoming a patron at patreon.com, or making a one time donation at PayPal. The links to all that are down below in the description. Also, in the description, you're going to find links to my Amazon wish list for books and movies. If you decide to support me by purchasing me one of those, that'd be fantastic. And we'll set up a Zoom call to discuss that book or that movie. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be reading and reflecting on chapter 342. I hope you'll join me. Until then, take care of yourselves and others.